Hey, happy November, my birthday month. Welcome to Crime Dive. My name is Crystal Sky, and if you're anything like me, you find yourself drawn to true crime cases. So that's what I talk about. If you like true crime, and you also want to feel better about your makeup skills, you should totally like, subscribe, and come hang out with me every Tuesday, where I will take a deep dive look into a true crime case while slapping on the old clown paint. So yeah, like I said, it's it's my birthday month. It is my birthday episode. So I decided that I wanted to take a deep dive look into a case that of course is very well known, but I personally have never been able or took the time to do like a deep thorough like research on this case. So yeah, for my, my, my birthday episode, I am going to look at the Andrea Yates case. Yes. And because there's just so much to unpack, because I really did not really know the extent of her mental health background prior to, you know, the ultimate murder of her children. And it's just, it's, it's just one of those cases that's just sad all the way around. I mean, all the cases are sad, but you know what I mean. So yeah, buckle up because uh, we are going to get into part one. Yes, like I said, there's a lot to get into with this case. So we are about to dive into part one of the Andrea Yates case. And disclaimer wise, in part one, we are mainly going to go over Andrea's mental, mental health background, you know, like her upbringing and whatnot prior to, you know, the ultimate deaths of her children. So we won't be talking about the actual murders in part one. That will be part two. So yeah, just disclaimer wise, just a lot of talk of depression and mental health and stuff like that. Alrighty, let's let's just get into it because there's a lot to go over. Alrighty, so Andrea Yates was actually born Andrea Pia Kennedy, and she was born on July 2nd, 1964 in Hallsville, Texas. Her mother's name was Yuta Karen Kohler, I hope I said that right, who was a German immigrant and worked as a manager in retail shops. Andrea's father was Andrew Emmett Kennedy, whose parents were Irish immigrants. He worked as a Ford engineer and later as a high school shop teacher. Now, Andrea was the baby of the family. She was the youngest of five children. She had three older brothers named Andrew, Patrick, and Brian. It is said that Andrea was especially closest to Brian, and she had an older sister named Michelle. Andrea grew up in Southeast Houston and came from a pretty average, you know, normal, stable upbringing. Now, during her teenage years, Andrea suffered with body image issues. She also reportedly had issues with bulimia and depression. It is said that she did talk to one friend in high school when she was about 17 about, you know, depression and suicide and that kind of stuff. However, despite struggling with these issues on the inside, on the outside, Andrea seemed to be, you know, pretty successful, which is super common, right? You just, you never know what someone is really going through, right? How many silent battles they are going through. So though Andrea is suffering from these kinds of issues that frankly she will have, honestly, the rest of her life. On the outside, she seems to be super happy. She was a super high achiever. Apparently, everyone in the Kennedy family was. They all had numerous goals and high aspirations. And it is said everyone in the Kennedy family worked very hard to achieve those goals, Andrea included. Andrea was captain of the swim team and was said to be really good at the sport. Apparently, her team won district championships quite often, quite often. She she was, she's pretty good at it. And apparently back in those days, the girls and boys teams like swam as like one team. And each year they would elect a boy and girl like captain of the team. And in Andrea's senior year, she was elected the female captain. It is said she took the sport pretty seriously. She would practice like two hours every day after school. She was a historian and officer in the National Honor Society, took honors courses in high school to prepare 
prepare for college. And though on the inside, you know, she was going through these, you know, battles, these internal struggles, on the outside, not only was she a high achiever, she was also said to have like a good dry sense of humor, you know, she was quite witty. And you would have never guessed that, you know, she was, she was going through some pretty serious stuff on the inside, you know. Her best friend, fellow swim teammate, and fellow honor society member, Marlene Berta, said that her and Andrea were, you know, they, they were wallflowers. They were pretty quiet. Andrea even signed Marlene's yearbook, quote, the struggling butterfly. Though she was quiet and kind of like um, a loner, it is said that Andrea did have like a small, tight, close-knit group of friends, you know? So she was quiet, but not quite a, a loner, you know? One of her teachers, Judy Bradley, remembered Andrea as quiet, quote, but she would participate in class discussions and class activities and certainly was friendly. But she was not the very, very outgoing, glad-handing type of student. And yeah, like I said, though, you know, Andrea did have friends and did socialize, Judy said, quote, she was definitely more a participant rather than a leader. So even way back when, even way back here in high school, Andrea is sort of, we could say passive, you know, maybe a little bit submissive, definitely not assertive, right? Andrea was described as being one of those that like never wanted to stir up any trouble. She never wanted to cause anyone any inconvenience. And it is said that this is actually like a Kennedy family trait. Apparently, you know, you'd ask something like, oh, you know, do you want like a drink of water or like some food or something? You know, and they'd respond with something like, oh yeah, you don't have to do that. And there are some who knew Andrea, including her future husband, that said due to this, to this trait, it was, it was sometimes hard to get a read on Andrea. Hard to kind of get a read on, you know, what she was thinking or feeling, you know? So I guess we could say she's pretty guarded, which I can certainly relate to that. Andrea was the class valedictorian when she graduated Milby High School in 1982. And after high school, she completed a two-year pre-nursing program at the University of Houston. And while she did this, she also checked groceries in order to support herself. And she would ultimately graduate from the University of Texas Health Science Center at Houston with her nursing degree. And from 1986 to 1994, Andrea worked as a registered nurse at the University of Texas MD Anderson Cancer Center. She worked in the oncology department working with cancer patients. A woman who knew Andrea said that she was an excellent nurse, quote, but you can tell a nurse, they're caretakers. And you could tell she had those qualities in her. She was a little caretaker. And although Andrea, you know, loved her work, she loved being a nurse and loved working with patients. It is said that during this time, she was treated for depression. And like I said earlier, this is definitely something that she will struggle with the rest of her life. So in the summer of 1989, so she's, you know, working as a nurse, Andrea would meet her future husband, Russell Rusty Yates. And this is the first time that she would meet him. They evidently lived in the same apartment complex in Houston. Rusty was 24 when he first laid eyes on Andrea. So apparently they were both at like the complex pool. And, you know, Rusty looked over and noticed Andrea just sort of floating in the pool. You know, she's in her bikini looking all cute and stuff. And, you know, he's thinking to himself like, oh my God, I'm like, you know, this girl's like kind of cute and kind of hot. I'm gonna, you know, shoot my shot, you know. And he struck up a conversation with her but it didn't really, like, it didn't really go anywhere, you know? Like, it didn't end with them making a date or anything, you know? And it wouldn't be until after Rusty's 25th birthday that the two would become an item. So one evening in November 1989, Rusty, he's on the phone, right? And he gets a, gets a knock on his door. And so without hanging up the phone, you know, he goes to answer the door and what do you know? It's Andrea. She told him, you know, introduced herself and like, hey, I live below you and and my car got hit in the parking lot, you know? And, you know, just, just want to know if you've, like, heard anything, saw anything, or, you know, anything like that. And, you know, Rusty's like, no, I'm sorry. You know, I don't know anything about that. And so, you know, she was like, okay, thanks. And, you know, leaves. And, you know, Rusty, like I said, he hadn't hung up the phone, told the person he was on the phone with, I believe it was like a friend, that he had just met the most stunning woman. The most stunning woman. And, quote, I'm gonna have to find out who she is. And, like, it's seems like from this moment on, the two sort of became an item. Andrea would later admit to Rusty that her car hadn't really been hit in the parking lot. That was just a ruse, an excuse to knock on his door and, you know, talk to him and get to know him. She was, you know, lonely and kind of shy and wanted some kind of way to strike up a conversation.
conversation with him. So let's get a little bit more into Rusty here. So Russell Rusty Yates was born September 6th, 1964 to Dora and Russell Yates in Queens, New York. Dora was a former flight attendant turned housewife, and Russell was a salesman who also worked as a railroad man. Rusty also had a younger brother named Randall that they nicknamed Randy. And when Rusty was four years old, the family moved from New York to Tennessee, and they ended up settling in Hermitage. Now, Dora had always been pretty religious, and she always took her boys to work. Rusty's dad, though, uh, Russell Sr., didn't really participate. He wasn't too, too religious, it seems. But, you know, it's, he wasn't like an absent father or anything. Um, in fact, he actually volunteered as a packmaster because Rusty was a Cub Scout and he actually volunteered as packmaster of Rusty's Cub Scout group. Just seems that his dad wasn't really into the religious thing. Like his dad, Rusty was very good with tools and he would go on to describe his dad as a quote, not a deep thinker and quote, very loud, outgoing, and friendly. And eventually Dora would end up finding a new church, the Hermitage United Methodist Church. And it would actually become the Yates Family Church. Apparently, even Russell Sr. attended the church with the family. Dora would end up getting a job at a high school teaching. I'm not sure what exactly. And Rusty ended up attending DuPont High School. He and a friend that he had had since junior high, Tracy Alvarez, attended with him. The two also attended church together. And the two were even involved in the Methodist Youth Fellowship, which was a group of young church members who met on Sundays, specifically Sunday evenings during the school year. And during the summer, they would go on church trips together. Now, Rusty was a pretty tall, domineering guy. He was six foot two by the time he was in 10th grade. But despite his, you know, domineering stature and like physical stature, he was described as a quote, good guy who could be friends with anyone. His friend Tracy said, quote, he could be so carefree at times. Then at the next minute, he could be very serious. You know, about his religion, whatever. Religion was very important to him then, especially. Tracy said that Rusty was a good football player and was, quote, extremely intelligent. Rusty claimed in his sophomore year of high school, he actually grew bored in his geometry class because he could, like, already predict the, the, the problem and the answer before his professor had even, like, finished writing it out on the board. He said, quote, it was just obvious. And Rusty didn't understand why no one else saw it. In Rusty's senior year of high school, he was taking AP classes for English, Chemistry, and calculus, was also president of the National Honor Society, served on the student council, lettered in football, played tennis, received the geometry award in his junior year, was voted class favorite, and had been chosen for, I don't know, like some like book or pamphlet that was like sent out called The Who's Who Among American High School Students and The Society of Distinguished American High School Students. Tracy said of Rusty, quote, I think what stuck in our minds was that he played football, but was in all the advanced classes. You know, whereas most people, they're like either a geek or a jock or a goth or whatever, you know, like they're, they're some sort of like specific social group, you know? It is said Rusty was able to navigate between like the, the jock and the geek group like quite easily. He easily navigated these two very different social spheres. Quote, he got along with everyone. He was good to everybody. He respected others. And I think people respected him for that. I never heard him say anything bad about others. Never. He could fit into any situation, whatever was handed to him. It is said Rusty actually went out of his way to help others, including like tutoring or or, you know, helping change a tire or something. He was just kind of like an all around, like, good guy. It is said Rusty, he was uh, pretty shy and kind of socially awkward at first. You know, he didn't really make eye contact a whole lot and sort of stuttered a little bit. But once he got to know someone, you know, and you were like his friend and, you know, he could open up a little bit. It is said that, yeah, he was much more outgoing and relaxed and, yeah, much more talkative and stuff. And whenever Rusty, like, spoke, in public or was like nervous, anxious, even excited, uh, like his hands would shake. And on August 11th, 1981, during Rusty's senior year of high school, his father dropped dead of a heart attack exactly the day his own father had died before Rusty had even been born. Some friends noted that Rusty really buckled down after this, like more so than before, but they didn't know if it was because of his grief or because it was his senior year of high school and so he was, you know, prepping to go to college and stuff. Rusty ended up graduating third in his class, and he ended up going to Auburn University on a Navy ROTC scholarship. 
He majored in math and tutored athletes. And in June and July of 1983, he actually served on a Navy destroyer. But in the winter of 1984, Rusty determined that like a life in the Navy wasn't really for him. And he ended up dropping out of ROTC and gave up his scholarship. But I do believe he still attended Auburn University. While at Auburn, Rusty interned at NASA, specifically in the cooperative program. So the norm, all right, was that each student worked three alternating school school semester slash terms. And during their tenure at NASA, they were instructed to, you know, either like program something, build something, like whatever, whatever like specific, you know, specialty they were in, you know. And at the end of the school semester, the students would give like, like a presentation, like slash report before their manager who would then, you know, grade them. And it is said that, you know, unless there were funding issues, if you did a good job, NASA pretty much offered you a job right out the gate. And that's exactly what happened to Rusty. I don't know exactly when, but we do know that NASA offered him a job, which he accepted, and I believe he worked there right out of college. And it was around this time when he was attending school and interning at NASA that Rusty was sort of looking for a religious identity. I guess he wasn't satisfied with United Methodists anymore. And he would actually meet someone while he was at college that would really shape his uh, religious ideology and philosophy. This man was a traveling fundamentalist evangelical preacher named Michael Warnicki. I hope that's how you say his name. Actually, I don't really care because um, this guy is kind of a tool bag. He's kind of like Doyle Davidson, if you remember. And that's actually one of his many names. So Michael preached that you must serve Jesus and not the church. And this right here really resonated with Rusty, this specifically right here. So Michael and his wife, Leslie, uh, she would later change her name to Rachel, and their six children would travel around the country and go to college campuses and preach that fire and brimstone stone kind of preaching that, you know, everyone was going to hell and that college campuses are evil because they hold like liberal ideologies that goes away from Jesus and, you know, blah, 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 blah. On top of all this, he denounced like every like organized religion and like organized church saying that it was like all a sham. Michael would uh, force his children who of course were all homeschooled and had no social contact outside of their family to go around the college campuses and hand out like leaflets and flyers and stuff, put up signs and whatnot. And on the rare occasion, someone like actually was interested in anything Michael was saying and tried to engage him in like a legitimate intellectual debate or, you know, legitimate questions. You know, he, he did what a lot of grifters do, you know, just sort of didn't answer questions, double talked or just straight up ignored him, you know. And when, you know, people were like, why are you coming here and telling us all that we're evil and going to hell. Like, what? Like, why are you even here? Like, what's the point? He said that he was there to, quote, save the chosen few. Yeah, again, deep, deep Doyle Davidson vibes. And this message that Michael preached specifically about going against any type of, like, organized religion or, like, organized church or something really resonated with Rusty, all right? And he felt comfortable not going to church and instead opening the Bible and like kind of studying for himself, kind of holding like his own private version of church. You know what I mean? And this is why Rusty held Michael in such heart, high regard, you know, because it was, you know, Michael that kind of got him to sort of thinking about that and doing that. Rusty corresponded with Michael for like a year or two out of college. And Rusty even called his mother, Dora, and told her, quote, I think I'm pretty much beginning to believe this stuff. Joy came over me. And for the next several years after college, I think he may have stayed in contact with Michael, like I said like a year or two max out of college, but for the most part, he kind of fell out of contact with Michael for a while. But as soon as Rusty started dating Andrea, he ended up corresponding with Michael about once a year or so, and Andrea would end up corresponding with Michael's wife. We'll get into that later. So when Rusty met Andrea, he was a junior engineer at NASA, working at the Johnson Space Center, specifically in the space shuttle program, and he earned $80,000 a year. One coworker said Rusty, you know, never come complained, always completed tasks. Quote, he seemingly did okay. He wasn't the brightest star. But at NASA, there were some of Rusty's co-workers that were not 
huge fans of his, all right? And I do not blame them one bit. So, of course, because of Rusty's ideology and whatnot, he uh, was a sexist and a misogynist. He would actually tell the women that he was working with, his colleagues, all right, his co-workers, other women, other engineers who worked hard to get where they were at NASA, like why they were there and why they weren't home taking care of their children. Yeah. They accused him of saying things like, you know, quote, why aren't you home with your children? And quote, you should be home where you belong. You know, like he very much believed a woman's place was in the kitchen. And look, look, dude, look, you can totally hold that in my opinion, stupid, view all you want, right? Like whatever floats your boat. But don't you dare sit there and judge other people who don't adhere to that belief. You know what I mean? Like how dare he say that kind of stuff? Like, can you believe that? Can you believe that? Like, I would like to think that today he wouldn't get away with stuff like that, but... So like I said, not long after Andrea's knock on Rusty's door, they pretty much, you know, become a couple. They began dating and they would move in together in 1992. Now, I do not believe they slept together when they lived together. Um, a lot of friends of both Rusty and Andrea describe them both as sort of prudish. Rusty says that he had been intimate before he met Andrea, but I believe Andrea had never been intimate before. I believe she was a virgin. And during Christmas of 1992, after they had moved in together, Rusty proposed. And on March 30th, 1993, Rusty closed on a home in Friendswood, Texas. And he moved into the home alone. And just a couple weeks later, on April 17th, 1993, Rusty and Andrea got married. They honeymooned in Cancun. Rusty bought Andrea some Samsonite luggage. And Andrea bought Rusty a set of golf clubs. They announced they, quote, would seek to have as many babies as nature would allow. And then the couple moved into the four bedroom home in Friendswood with plans to immediately fill it up with children. A couple who knew both Andrea and Rusty and knew them like as a couple before they were married and were dating. The wife would of course end up being closer to Andrea and the husband would actually end up being friends with Rusty. Described Rusty and Andrea as not really being like affectionate. You know, they didn't hold hands. They didn't kiss like no PDAs or anything like that. They didn't call each other like, you know, hung or baby or anything like that. No nicknames. And upon first meeting this couple, apparently Andrea and Rusty announced that they would want to have six kids. Yeah, this was before they were like even married. So they already had plans to have like a lot of children. Now the woman of this couple was actually a psychiatric nurse who I believe worked at the same like hospital as Andrea and knew her before she started dating Rusty. She said of the couple, quote, I feel strongly that at the time it was more Rusty who wanted a large family. And she is the type of person that went along. She was this submissive wife. From the minute I met her, you know, submissive, meek, and mild. The nicest person you'll ever meet. She said Rusty, quote, was not real friendly or outgoing. Not with females anyway. And big shock, right? Because Rusty just sees them as walking, talking incubators. She said Rusty definitely needed like a submissive type of person. And there's no way he could have ever married like a type of like independent woman, quote, because then he could not have been domineering. She said Rusty needed a submissive type, quote, somebody who would buy into his future plans. Andrea was a sweet, easygoing person. I think he probably saw that this was a mild, meek person. I think that attracted him to her because I think he had these beliefs and values way before he even married her. He wouldn't have married a strong, I mean, he wouldn't have married a Katie Couric. He wouldn't have married somebody like that. He wanted somebody he could control. And I don't say that in a negative way. Yeah, pretty much saying that, you know, Rusty had this very specific idea of what his family was going to be like. And it seems Andrea had the, the perfect type of personality that he was looking for, right? Now, this friend would later reveal a pretty frustrating conversation that she had with Rusty. Remember, she's a psychiatric nurse. And she had this conversation with Rusty not long after him and Andrea started dating. So he asked her about, you know, her work and she told him. And he reportedly said, quote, I don't believe in mental illness. And she was like, you know, like, like, what? Like, huh? Come again? And he repeated, quote, I don't believe in it. I believe everybody has choices in life. And that's a cop out. He ranted on saying psychiatric illnesses were, quote, malarkey. That people could control their brains if they really wanted to. And people could change if they really wanted to. This conversation, all right, infuriated this chick, who again is a psychiatric nurse, infuriated her so much, she said she had to like 
physically walk away from him because like she she wanted to like you know deck him and I don't blame her at all. She said she thought to herself, quote, you never know when it's going to be at your back door. Mm hmm. So a year after they were married, Andrea and Rusty would have their first child, a son that they named Noah Jacob Yates. And he was born on February 26th, 1994. A psychiatric nurse friend of Andrea said that she was, quote, the most devoted, dedicated mother I had ever seen. I mean, she wasn't selfish at all. Now, Andrea continued working as a nurse right up until Noah's birth. And after she gives birth to Noah, she would never never go back to work. Andrea breastfed Noah, read to him, taught him to walk and talk. Noah was described as being a little engineer, much like his father. Apparently he could, you know, go to a fast food place, get like a little happy meal or something and, and get the toy out. He'd play with it for like five or 10 minutes. And then he would take it apart and put it back together again. He also had like this, this like little like fake book with like a speaker in it. And when he didn't like the, the way that the speaker sounded anymore, it was starting to get distorted. He took another like fake book that also had a speaker in it and took it and installed it into the old music book using a hot glue gun as a soldering gun. It is said Noah was content to be alone and, you know, and play and he loved arts and crafts, much like his mother. His favorite thing to draw were, were rainbows. He loved to draw, loved art. He loved collecting bugs and his favorite shows were Who Wants to Be a Millionaire and Scooby-Doo. And there was one time, right? Right, where Noah wanted to stay up past his bedtime because he wanted to watch Air Bud. And Rusty was like, oh, well, you know what? Like, you gotta, gotta answer a trivia question, right? And it's gonna be a trivia question about the U.S. presidents. Thinking that, like, you know, oh, I'll, I'll give him, you know, a hard one. Give him one that, like, he obviously isn't gonna get. So, you know, get him to bed. And the question was, what year President Garfield had been born? And Noah had answered 1831, like, just as the question was, like, barely out of Rusty's mouth. Apparently they had like a placemat on their kitchen table that had like, I think like the birth dates and stuff like that, like some facts about all of the US presidents. And apparently Noah had, had memorized it. So he was definitely quite, quite the thinker, you know, he had, had quite the brain. Now, even back here, all right, even back in this time when they only have one child, it is clear that the dynamics were, were clearly delineated and drawn in the Yates household. Andrea took care of the child in the home and Rusty went to work and earned the living. He was the provider. He actually set up accordion files for each him and Andrea, right? And on the, the tabs of these files were, you know, stuff like, like groceries for Andrea or like car repair for, for himself or whatever, right? And he would put cash in each of these files. And whenever, you know, Andrea needed to go shopping or, you know, whatever, they would go to these accordion files, go to the appropriate tab and take out the cash. Apparently Rusty called this the bank. And yeah, the, the Yates household was a, a cash only endeavor, right? It was cash only. It's also said that Rusty made Andrea give him uh, haircuts at home. Um, and you know, it had to be perfect. And Andrea was like, and every time she would cut her husband's hair, it is said that like Andrea's hands like shook because she, you know, wanted to be so perfect for him. You know, it was, it was very clear that, you know, Rusty, Rusty was the breadwinner and was like the man of the house and Andrea, you know, was his dutiful wife and she just kind of, you know, went along with it and she wanted to make her husband happy. Now, it wasn't too long after Noah's birth, probably like within a few months, that Andrea's friend, you know, the psychiatric nurse, suggested that she work per diem, you know, part-time work. That way, Andrea could still be like a full-time mom, but, you know, she can keep her, her nursing skills up to par, right? Like, when you don't do certain skills, right, they kind of, they kind of go away, you know, they kind of atrophy. The friend said that she did this herself when her own children had been born, and she worked two to three days a week, and it really, you know, it, it really worked out well for her, and she, you know, told Andrea, like, you should look into that. And she said Andrea really brightened up at this notion and it seemed something really interesting, but this topic was was dropped and Andrea never brought it up again. And the friend wondered if she had even brought it up to Rusty or maybe she did bring it up to Rusty and he didn't like that. Yeah, she didn't know, but they, they never talked about that again. She did say up until this point, she herself noticed no visible signs of depression in Andrea. Now, no more than a year after Noah's birth, Andrea was pregnant with her and Rusty's second child. 
child. Another son that they named John Samuel Yates. And he was born on December 15th, 1995. Now, John was described as being a, a quote, rough and tumble type of, type of kid. He loved to roughhouse. He had a, like, wide, contagious smile. And when he smiled, it really, like, showed the gap in his front teeth. They said he made friends very easily. Enjoyed playing t-ball in a homeschool league. But even though, you know, it's great. They, they have no one, John, and, and it's happy. And Andrea loves her children. At this point, she's a little overwhelmed. Now, it is said Rusty did step in and help at this time. He apparently, you know, sold his golf clubs because he just didn't have time to play golf anymore. And when he was home, he did uh, help out. He would kind of tend to Noah and watch him while Andrea breastfed John. But even still, apparently, even even still, the roles were, were clearly drawn. Andrea cooked all the meals and cleaned the house. And that was primarily her main responsibility. And Rusty would help when he was home. It is said every evening, the couple would load the children in the stroller and then they would go for a walk in the neighborhood. Every Wednesday afternoon, Andrea would take the kids to her parents' house. And here they would have lunch and Andrea would go walking with her father who was suffering from Alzheimer's. And in 1996, all right, not long after John's birth, Rusty found out that NASA planned on sending him to Clearwater, Florida to work for Honeywell. And when when Rusty discovers this, a little light bulb goes off in his head and he thinks like, hey, this might be a perfect opportunity to live out my dream. And what was that dream? He always wanted to travel around in a trailer and like live in it, never really have a permanent home or job. And when he discovered that he was going to be transferred to Florida for a little bit, he thought this was like the perfect opportunity to, to make this happen and see like what life on the road would be like. He had Andrea sell all their possessions, like most of their furniture and most of their wedding gifts, but he made sure to keep his tools and workout equipment and got a storage shed for those. Rusty rented out the home in Friendswood and then Rusty, Andrea, Noah, and John moved into a Jayco 376 FB trailer that contained a few upgrades, including quote, fancy cabinets, whatever that means, and like a nice stereo system. So apparently he did like kind of update it a little bit. And it about is about this same time that Andrea is corresponding with uh, Michael Warnecki's wife, Leslie. I don't think she had gone by Rachel yet, but yeah, Leslie slash Rachel. Andrea had received a thank you letter from Leslie slash Rachel for like, I guess she had sent them like some cookies and some money. And it is when the Yates are setting out on the road for the first time that Andrea writes Leslie slash Rachel. I'm just gonna call her Rachel. And she, she tells Rachel and writes to her about feeling lonely, about how hard it was, and also asks for her advice on books that her boys might like to read. Now, Rachel wrote back and said Andrea should view her loneliness in relation to salvation. When compared, she implied that loneliness was not significant. And she directed Andrea to Titus 2 in the New Testament, which talks about like the role of women to love their husbands, their children, to be sensible, pure, work at the home, be kind, and to subject to their own husband. You know, so that the word of God would not be a dishonored. Rachel actually wrote, quote, Jesus knows how wicked you are, how weak and vulnerable but she said God, quote, is able to sympathize with your weaknesses. Even the loneliness works to draw you to seek and find security in him. Yeah, very brimstone and fire type of stuff, right? Now, neither Rachel nor Michael themselves had jobs. Like I said, they would go around the country, you know, preaching fire and brimstone, and they relied on donations from people like the Yates. And whenever they were asked, like, how they supported themselves and their children, I guess Rachel would just say, quote, seek Jesus not in the church or religion and not in the system. The system system cannot save you because it is based in Satan. The world offers nothing else and the world does not have the answers. Yeah, like I said, in actuality, they relied on donations. So yeah, again, very Doyle Davidson-y, right? So in October of 1996, the Yates, with their 38-foot trailer and their new blue Suburban, pulled into the Lazy Days RV compound located in Hitchcock, Texas. Now, Rusty would brag to anyone who would listen that both his house and the trailer were paid off in full. He was very proud of this fact. And they would be at this RV park for only a month before Rusty was transferred to Florida. And by the time the Yates pulled into the holiday campground in Seminole, Florida, Andrea was pregnant yet again. However, in November, the next month, her stomach cramped really bad. So much so that Rusty actually had to rush her to the hospital located in St. Petersburg. And here, Andrea would miscarry. Now, the Yates were only in Florida for six months. And by the time they were back at the Lazy Day, 
Hayes RV compound in Hitchcock, Texas, Andrea was pregnant with what would be their third child. It was another son that they would name Paul Abraham Yates, and he would ultimately be born on September 13th, 1997. Now, it is said Paul was the most affectionate out of all the Yates children. He was also the most obedient, and the, the one child that, you know, you just had to tell him to do something once, and he did it. He was given the nickname Bull Moose, and this was because of a, of a moose shirt that he loved to wear every day, like every day. It was actually like so worn from being washed every day. And he also got this nickname from like a children's story about like a caboose who chooses to live in a tree. So that's how they gave him his silly little nickname, Bull Moose. Now the manager of the RV park, the Lazy Days RV park, her name was Belinda Green. And she grew somewhat close to the Yates family while they were there, at least for some time. And she, along with others in the RV park, just noticed how perfect and dedicated a mother Andrea was. Everyone noticed it. In fact, Belinda thought maybe like Andrea was almost too perfect of a mother, you know? She just like was so perfect straight out of a fairy tale. She noticed how Andrea was like patient yet firm with her children. But she noticed that Rusty was, was very quick to correct them. Now, according to Rusty, he wanted to, quote, train his children. And to that end, he would only repeat an instruction like once. And if they didn't follow it quickly, he said he didn't see any reason to keep telling them. He would simply get the paddle. He believed paddling was love and teaching, whereas hitting was anger and jealousy. And to that end, he did believe in paddling his children. Quote, you can't explain diplomatic relations to a two-year-old. He said out of all of the boys, John was the one who who needed a, quote, reassuring paddling more often than Noah or Paul. How about, no, how about you don't physically hit your children to teach them something? Now, as with the expectations of his children, Belinda thought that Rusty also pressured Andrea to be the perfect wife and mother. In May of 1998, the family took off for yet another trip to Florida. The Warnikis, who were living in Florida at that time, were selling their Greyhound bus. And Rusty wanted to check it out, you know? Remember, he wants to live on the road. So he's thinking like a renovated Greyhound bus would be quite, you know, quite the upgrade. The Yates would end up buying the Greyhound bus, but when they returned to Texas, they had not brought it with them. They were still in their normal trailer. And when they returned from this Florida trip, again, they were only gone a couple weeks. Andrea was pregnant with their fourth child who had been conceived in the trailer. When Belinda found out about this, she asked them how many children they were planning on having. And Rusty told her, quote, as many as God gives us. But it was when they returned from this Florida trip that Rusty's demeanor kind of kind of changed. He was no longer like outgoing or friendly with Belinda, whom he had really come to rely on for like trailer advice and stuff. And he would talk to her a lot. That's how she came to grow a little close to the family. But when he gets back from this Florida trip after looking at Michael's Greyhound bus, he's all of a sudden like not very warm or friendly to her anymore. He wouldn't speak to anyone. And when he would come home and see like the boys playing like in the yard with like Belinda's children. He would just bark in at his children, quote, get in the house, boys. And he wouldn't let like Belinda's children come over and play or anything. And Belinda's children thought that like Rusty hated them or something. And they had no idea why. Like why he just turned into a dick? Like, isn't that messed up? Andrea seemed to remain pretty friendly though. In July of 1998, she's still corresponding with Rachel. Andrea receives like some letters from her. In these letters, Rachel is very glad that Andrea is taking her past advice and stuff to heart. Quote, I'm so glad you're getting into the word and being diligent to seek Jesus. He alone will save you. Not doing right or being right, but coming to know him. She also told Andrea that her family had befallen some financial setbacks. And in a letter to Rusty that was written by Rachel, but dictated by Michael, they thanked the Yates for a financial contribution that they had made to them. In October of 1998, Rusty just straight up sold the house in Friendswood and the Yates settled into the Lazy Days are V Park. Only now they had the Greyhound bus with them at this point on top of their trailer. They lived in the travel trailer while Rusty worked to like renovate the Greyhound bus and like bring it up to snuff. Rusty had told Belinda that he had dreamed of traveling and working some kind of job from like home so that way he could stay home with his family more. And Andrea still corresponded with Rachel who kept going on her asinine spiel. She hoped Andrea was still studying the Bible, spoke of the woes befallen on her family, illnesses, a sore 
restrained voice for Michael. Rachel wrote how she was upset no one was taking them seriously on the college campuses. She wrote to Andrea how she had to get right with God and that quote, the window of opportunity that God has opened up for you at this time through us will only stay open for a certain time. And she said the Greyhound bus was obviously God's way of breaking quote, that yuppie comfort oriented mentality. The women of the RV park, they threw Andrea a baby shower for her upcoming fourth child. And by this time, the Yates had sold the travel trailer and had lived in the Greyhound bus, which Rusty had renovated. And on February 15th, 1999, Andrea gave birth to the couple's fourth child, yet another son who they would name Luke David Yates. Luke was given the nickname Bulldozer because it is said that he was like the type of kid who just sort of like took what he wanted. There was a story about like how before he could even walk, he tried to get past Rusty who was like blocking his way in a hallway and he just like creamed his way through there. Quote, he was going to get by me, whether he'd push me or poke me in the eye, whatever he needed to do. It is said every morning, Luke would get his bowl, his spoon and his cereal and put it all on the table and wait patiently for someone to pour his milk for him. It is said Luke was also the more fidgety of his siblings. He had trouble sitting still, had some trouble with boundaries. And it is after Luke's birth that the RV park residents, they notice, they, they start to notice that they don't really see Andrea a whole lot. But they didn't really think too much of it. I mean, after all, she has four boys all under the age of five. And whenever the residents did see Andrea out and about, they noticed just how utterly tired and exhausted she looked. Now, not long after Luke's birth, like I think mere weeks, the Yates family took a took a road trip to the Grand Canyon in Lake Mead. And it was on this return trip that Rusty claims he realized that the Greyhound bus situation wasn't really going to work out anymore. It was just much too small for the family of six. In fact, it was so cramped and tiny that two of the boys, I'm guessing Noah and John because they were older, slept in the lift door that was the bus's like front wheel well. And upon their return from this, this road trip to the Grand Canyon in Lake Mead, in a rare like personal confessional moment to Belinda, Andrea revealed that on the trip, Rusty had like gotten the bus stuck in Flagstaff, driving down like some snowy mountain roads or something. And that like it really frightened her. And she was like, you know, about to like kind of open up a little bit more, maybe kind of reveal a little bit more about like what she was feeling. But she immediately shut up because Rusty walked in right at that moment. Belinda ran into Andrea and the four boys at Walmart one time. Rusty was back home at the bus doing nothing. And Belinda noted to herself how she noticed that back when they only had like two boys, Andrea at least got like a mom's day out once a week where she got to like go out and do whatever she wanted. However, she and the other RV park residents noticed that the more kids the family seemed to have, the less Rusty seemed to like help and the more tired and exhausted Andrea looked. But Rusty didn't look like that. They noticed that Andrea was no longer like happy and upbeat like she once was. Now to Belinda, to her, it came off as if like Rusty believed Andrea's pure job was to take care of the kids all on her own. She also noticed how the oldest child, Noah, who was always like likable yet very, very nervous, became even more nervous. He like stuttered when he talked because he was trying like so hard and fast to like get the words out of his mouth that he would like stumble. And then yeah, Rusty just stopped talking to Belinda like altogether. He had had talked to her like once in a blue moon after they had gotten back from Florida. But after after this past like family trip, he he completely ignored her and like iced her out. Andrea, meanwhile, who had always talked about her children and was always, you know, friendly and outgoing, she never really talked anymore. I mean, she looked so utterly tired and exhausted. Now, about three or four months after Luke's birth, Andrea's depression was really triggered. So on June 16th, so just a few months after Luke's been born, Andrea phoned Rusty at work and he came home to the bus. It had been raining for, for like a week at that point and Andrea had been feeling what she had called, quote, sad and depressed. And when Rusty walked into the bus, he found that Andrea had, I guess, like chewed and gnawed at like her, her fingernails and like her cuticles and stuff. And she was like shaking and trembling and she told him, quote, I need help. And the next day, Rusty took Andrea to her parents' home where she, she felt more comfortable, relaxed. She said she just wanted to sleep forever. So they're over there. And then around 3 p.m., everyone's taking a nap. 
And while they are, Andrea attempts suicide. She goes to her father's medicine cabinet and swallows about 40 to 50 tablets of 50 milligrams of trazodone, which was an antidepressant and sedative. So she she swallows all that, she throws it up, and then falls asleep. Now, Luke ended up uh, waking up and crying, and so uh, Andrea's mom, you know, goes to her to wake up her, her daughter, you know, because she was breastfeeding Luke. So yeah, she was waking up her daughter like, hey, you need to feed the baby. And Andrea just sleepily replied, quote, I can't feed them, mom. I've just taken an overdose. Rusty rushed Andrea to the ER at Ben Taub General Hospital. This was located in Houston. And here she was given charcoal to make her vomit. And this was so like the pills wouldn't be absorbed into her body or into her system. She was diagnosed as having a major depressive disorder and was then referred to Methodist Hospital. And she was referred here to an inpatient admission with suicidal ideation. She was admitted to the psychiatric unit. And while while she's here, Andrea was just described as quiet, flat, and unable to to convey or communicate what exactly like caused her depression or triggered it. Nurses wrote, quote, patient understands she is on suicide precautions. Patient admits to anxiousness and overwhelming thoughts. Denies any suicidal ideation at present. Patient refused to sign any consent for meds, but understands if she needs medication for sleep, something was ordered. Apparently in Texas, even those under emotional emotional or like mental duress or stress have to consent to taking like any type of psychotropic drugs or anything like that. They have to consent to that. Now, when her social worker, Norma Toriak, interviewed Andrea, you know, trying to trying to get her to talk and open up, Norma found it very frustrating to get any answers out of her. All Andrea would say was, quote, I guess I was overwhelmed and depressed, but she wouldn't really elaborate further. After many, many attempts at trying to get a hold of Rusty to see if she could get some information from him, Norma finally got a hold of him. Rusty told her that Andrea had lost interest in pretty much everything, had become withdrawn, and he told her the circumstances that, you know, led Andrea to being admitted there. He described Andrea's family as, quote, strict Catholic and not very warm. However, Andrea has said that she was very close to her family and described her mother as, quote, supportive, sensitive, caring, and nurturing. When Norma asked Rusty about the state of their marriage, he said that the their, their strengths of their marriage was that they both held the same values and were both similar. They were both honest and trustworthy. And when asked about the weaknesses in their marriage, Rusty admitted to Norma that he could treat his wife with a little more respect. In the end, Norma's report read, quote, the patient's husband seems to be aware and accepting of the patient's problems. Except Except the patient's husband several times referred to the patient's diagnosis as postpartum depression as opposed to regular major depression. The patient's husband appeared to be aware of the family's part in the patient's problem and was willing to be involved in the treatment process. However, the flavor of the phone interview with the patient's husband was that the patient's husband might be a little bit controlling. Her current difficulties may be related to the stress of raising her children. Now, during her stay, her psychiatrist, Dr. James Flack, prescribed Andrea Zoloft and also prescribed her some sleeping pills. Andrea said that she had stopped breastfeeding at this point. And it seems that Andrea definitely had like good days and bad days while she was here. She was mostly nonverbal though and retreated back to her room, crawled into bed and covered herself with sheets when as often as she could. He said it was very difficult for the doctors and nurses to like get a clear picture to help Andrea because she was just so, you know, nonverbal and not really communicating. And Rusty, they felt, was like guarded with his information and they suspected that he wasn't telling them the whole truth. On June 24th, after only being in the hospital for a week, both Andrea and Rusty requested her to be discharged. Rusty stated the family was willing to watch her around the clock, and they were well aware that she was still at risk of harming herself. Then I don't understand why you'd want her out of the hospital, but whatever. Dr. Flack noted that, well, maybe her children and her family, maybe those would be more therapeutic because nothing here seems to be helping her. You know, like she's not opening up. Maybe being at home would be cathartic for her. He also 
referred Andrea to a female psychiatrist, Dr. Eileen Starbranch. Isn't that such a cool name, Starbranch? So on the evening of the 24th, Andrea was discharged. Although I guess in doctor's notes, it stated that it was due to like insurance restrictions. So I'm not sure if they really were all that comfortable discharging her. So I don't know, but our healthcare system is based on profit. So it's very believable. Dr. Flack wrote Andrea a prescription for 100 milligrams of Zoloft. Although her discharge summary stated that it was 150 milligrams and the maximum recommended dosage is no more than 200 milligrams. And soon Andrea's prescription was up to 250 milligrams. Now, some pharmacists have said that drugs like Zoloft and Prozac don't, don't work for some necessarily because all they do is primarily target the serotonin levels in the brain. But some who suffer from depression, they don't have a problem with their serotonin levels. They have a problem with norepinephrine levels. I don't know if I just said that right. I've been trying so hard to say that word, but this is the main neurotransmitter in the brain. And they were saying that at some people who have depression, that this is this is where their problem is. It's not the serotonin levels, it's this main transmitter in the brain. And when this is, is the primary cause, this is usually treated with tricyclic antidepressants, but apparently many doctors are like reluctant to prescribe them because I guess if you have like a suicidal patient, like it's extremely easy to overdose on those. So like, yeah, they're like really prescribed. And again, a lot of the information I did came from like resources and articles that were coming out as this case was happening. So if there's any like updates or, or anything like that, yeah, please drop it down in the comments below. Now, Andrea started seeing Dr. Starbranch upon her release in July, and she told her doctor that Zoloft was only helping her a little bit. And so Dr. Starbranch then gave Andrea some samples of the antipsychotic drug Zaprexia, and apparently this is only used in the most resistant of cases, okay? Now, it is said Andrea went home and flushed the samples down the toilet. But as the days went on, Andrea's condition deteriorated. Rusty hid any and all medications in the house, including knives. But soon, Andrea heard a voice telling her to get a knife. She would claw at her legs, leaving very deep scratches. She pulled at her hair and picked at her scalp, causing like sores and like bald spots on her scalp. And four weeks after she had been discharged from Methodist, on July 21st, Rusty walked into the bathroom at his in-law's home and he found Andrea pressing a steak knife to her neck, specifically to her carotid artery. She said, quote, I'm about to cut my throat. And as Rusty, you know, of course, lunged and, and wrestled for the knife, Andrea just said, quote, just let me do it. And Rusty got control of the knife. He took Andrea to Memorial Spring Shadows Glen Hospital, and this was located in Houston. This was a private exclusive psychiatric hospital, and it had a pretty disgusting past that included insurance fraud and staff planting false memories of uh, cult abuse in patients. Yeah, not the best history. Now, when Andrea was admitted to the hospital, it was under new ownership, who had re renamed it. It was originally just called Spring Shadows Glen Hospital. Now, as Andrea Andrea was being admitted. The nurses, you know, they noticed the marks on her neck from the knife, the, the open sores on her scalp, the bruises on her arms. She also had a deep scratch on her nose. And of course, they saw the scratches on her legs as well. Andrea told them that she scratched herself, but... This would be about all Andrea would tell them. She would nod her head every once in a while, but most of the information that the nurses gathered as they were admitting her came from Rusty. He said that Andrea's mood had been good that morning, but that her mood was always up and down. He said that she wasn't taking her Zaprexia, so I don't know if she did show it to Rusty. Maybe she flushed them down the toilet like after she had shown Rusty. I was a little confused about that little fact. And he also told the nurses that she had missed some doses of her Zoloft. And after much, much prompting and persuasion by Rusty, Andrea admitted herself into the hospital. However, she would not sign the consent to medication form. And the only things that she would say while she was admitted here, other than her desire to go to bed, was, quote, I'm here for postpartum depression. Quote, I'm here to get new pills. And quote, my thoughts are really fast often. That's, that's pretty much all, all she said. The only thing she said to a social worker who had tried to interview her was that she did feel like an only 
child growing up because she was the youngest. And she said that she had to start taking care of herself at a very early age. She refused to sign any clinical information and refused to sign a release that would allow the social worker to talk to Rusty or her mother. And she refused all psychotropic medication. She refused to dress for bed. And when nurses approached her to, you know, help her, she would like shrink away and like act very frightened, like scared animal. Dr. Starbranch said Andrea at this time was, quote, withdrawn and suspicious and, quote, she worries about her children. By the next day, after more failed attempts at psychological interviews and with Rusty's full support, medical staff injected Andrea with an emergency shot of Haldol, an antipsychotic drug prescribed in only the most desperate of situations. We've talked about it before. Now, Haldol had a myriad of side effects that included hallucinations, liver damage, and uncontrollable body movements. And this emergency shot of Haldol, it seemed to do the trick. And a few hours later, Andrea was sitting with Rusty and she seemed calm and he was stroking her hair. He had brought her flowers and yeah, it seemed that it seemed to do the trick for the, for the moment, you know. But the next day, Andrea still refused to open up, still refused to talk, simply saying, quote, can I go back to my room now? Now, when asked if she was suicidal, she wouldn't answer. Though staff noticed that her legs did shake. But yeah, whenever she was asked if she had suicidal thoughts, suicidal ideation, or anything like that, she wouldn't answer. She would just like look away. She finally consented to allowing medical staff to interview Rusty and her mother and finally consented to taking the Zyprexia. However, after a few days, it was noted in her patient file, quote, patient appears almost catatonic. And over the next several days, though they did try, Andrea just, just refused to open up, refused to talk. She would only answer when her like name was called. She ate and drank very, very little. She would only drink like some juice or even maybe like an Ensure protein shake. And that was just at Rusty's insistence. Like she she only did that stuff because Rusty told her to. She had visits with Rusty and her children. And at one point she was given another emergency dose of Haldol. This was after Andrea was observed, like, I guess, like acting paranoid. And I guess she had finally admitted that yes, she did have suicidal thoughts, but she said she had fewer of them. Finally, on July 28th, Andrea finally consented to an interview with a social worker. When she was asked a question, she would wait like 15, 20 seconds to answer and then it would need to be repeated. And then she admitted that she was feeling angry with herself because she didn't know how to commit suicide. She was mad that she hadn't successfully killed herself. Quote, I'm a nurse. I should have known what kind of OD to take. And regarding the knife to her neck, quote, I was trying to find my pulse point in my neck. She confessed that she had actually dealt with depression since the birth of Noah, her first son. She said that her marriage wasn't a problem and actually acknowledged that Rusty had stepped up and helped out more than he ever had. She did say that she needed more help with the children though, including some activities for herself. And she did admit that she did not take her Zoloft all the time. She, did, she didn't take it regularly. That evening, you know, after opening up, she ate all of her dinner. And that's when Rusty asked the staff when she could be discharged. She has like one good like evening and now all of a sudden this fool's asking when she can be discharged. They said they would have to ask Dr. Starbranch. And unfortunately, even though she was finally opening up to her social worker, the social worker had to tell Andrea that in two days they were going to leave the job. So she'd be issued a new social worker and Andrea wasn't too happy at this. The next morning she appeared in distress and again refused to answer if she was suicidal. Her parents along with her children visited her and afterwards Andrea said that, no, she wasn't suicidal, just tired. And on that same day, as Andrea's visiting the children and her parents, Rusty finally moved out of the Lazy Days RV park. He told anyone and everyone who would listen that he had actually just closed on a house for Andrea in Houston, specifically in the Houston suburb of Clear Lake City. But what he neglected to tell people was that he only got a house after a lot of pressure and uh, nagging from Andrea's mother, Karen. That's what she went by, Karen. She had told Rusty, quote, no more bus. And I say good for you. Yeah, stand up for your daughter. She can't be living in a Greyhound bus 
with four children? Like, are you kidding me? Karen had also given Rusty $7,000 to furnish the home for Andrea. Remember, the fool had sold all of their like wedding gifts and furniture and stuff. But instead, Rusty had used that money to extend the driveway so that they could keep their precious Greyhound bus and bought himself some nice gym equipment. Yeah, can you believe that? At one point, I guess Rusty took Andrea out of the hospital to visit to, you know, see the home. And, you know, he he was he thought it was just like the perfect location because of like its privacy, like a lot of private hedges and stuff like that. And he thought this would this would be a perfect time to renovate the bus anyway. And yeah, he was really trying to like, you know, pump it up and try to like hype it up for for Andrea, you know, like, oh, this place is so perfect. It's so, it, you know, it's going to work out perfectly. But Andrea was actually feeling very, very down. She was feeling like a failure. She felt that it like it was it was her fault that they had to move out of the Greyhound bus, which was like Rusty's dream and move into this house because of her. Like she just she felt like guilty. She felt like she had let everyone down. Can you believe that? And uh, as Andrea continued her her hospital stay, uh, yeah, Rusty did step up a little bit to help with the children. I'm pretty sure her parents were, were helping out a lot, but he was certainly, you know, helping out more than he had. He took the kids to like their, their t-ball game Games. I think the oldest two had t-ball games. And though the other parents noted that he did show up a few times without Andrea, they had they had no idea what was really going on. Parents, coaches, and like other people who were involved in the team in the league said that like had they known like even a fraction of what the Yates were going through at this time, they would have definitely stepped up and helped. But Rusty hadn't told anyone. When he appeared at the Lazy Days RV park, which I'm not even sure why he was visiting there since he was giving everyone the cold shoulder, but whatever when he was over there visiting, he just like mentioned nonchalantly that like Andrea had some depression and just like, yeah, brushed it off like it was no big deal. Belinda, I don't even think Belinda had any idea that Andrea was in the hospital. But yeah, it does seem that he was like helping out more with the children than he ever had. Remember the psychiatric nurse friend that Andrea had? You know, the one that was actually critical of Rusty? She did describe him as a devoted father. Quote, he was the devoted father, always there. All those things you want in a husband, you know, that helped you. I know he helped her with those kids. I know he was a good provider. And I think it was good that he saw that Andrea could not work and raise the kids. But then there's that thin line where he didn't want anybody babysitting the kids. He didn't want anybody because he didn't want any secular thoughts put in their heads. That's got to be domineering. No free time for herself. I never saw her do anything on her own. She said it wasn't particularly fair to Andrea and Rusty kind of seemed oblivious. Like after all, he got to go out into the world and talk to other adults and have a career. Meanwhile, you know, Andrea's at home with, with four young children. But her friend knew that she would never stand up to her husband. Quote, I don't know if she felt like this was Prince Charming who swept her off her feet. So yeah, he, he definitely helped out with the kids, but it seems, you know, kind of like with Belinda and the RV park people, right? That he's not stepping up enough, you know? It, it's very clear that he believes child rearing is mainly Andrea's responsibility, primarily, you know? When Andrea was being prepped, to transfer into adult service and group therapy at Shadows Glen. She seemed uh, distressed and she said that she didn't really care to transition and she didn't find it particularly useful. She was not a fan of the group therapy. When her new social worker tried to interview her, she simply just like walked out of the room. She was noted as being quote despondent and over the next few days, she refused to open up in group therapy or family therapy. She refused to eat, refused her medication and eventually she confessed that she started hearing voices and seeing visions of knives. Quote, I had a fear I would hurt somebody. I thought it better to end my own life and prevent it. I had a vision in my mind. Get a knife. Get a knife. Get a knife. I had a vision of this person being stabbed. She admitted that her first vision had occurred like right after Noah had been born, but then the visions had stopped. When asked who she feared she might harm, she didn't answer and just changed the subject and seemed to like be really uncomfortable. She said stressful situations aggravated her nervousness. And when asked what those stresses were, she said, quote, the kids trying to train them upright, being so young, big responsibility. I don't want to fail. She said she used to be much more outgoing and cheerful. Quote, not so self-centered as I am now. Yeah, can you, she thinks she's being self-centered. She said she had obsessive thoughts, mostly concerning her children and how they would turn out. And she said she picked at her scalp and her hair as a quote, nervous reaction. Her new social worker diagnosed Andrea with major depressive disorder, severe, recurrent with psychotic features. He suggested that if psychotropic drugs didn't work, he suggested electroconvulsive therapy. 
shock treatment. Yeah. He also said that Andrea needed help learning effective strategies to deal with stress, help in viewing herself more positively, help developing a more satisfying and effective support system, help developing assertive behavior, help learning to express her emotions appropriately, and help organizing her thinking. Bottom line, Andrea was going to need a lot of help and support. By August 5th, Rusty stopped by with the boys to visit her, and he told a nurse that when he came to see his wife, she hadn't showered or changed her clothes in like four or five days. And he spoke with a consulting physician, Dr. Arturo Rios. And Rusty had, you know, told Dr. Rios that like, hey, Andrea seemed to, you know, get better with that Haldol shot. I'm like, why don't we, why don't we give her some of that? After looking at her chart, Dr. Rios told Rusty like, hey, like if there was any improvement with the Haldol, it's very short lived. Like I can, I can tell from her chart. And like with Andrea's social worker, he suggested shock therapy. Like, what, like, is there some, like, humane, like, competent way that they are using shock therapy? Because everything I've read and heard, it's, it's horrendous. Like, it doesn't do anything. It's just, it's torture. And it, it damages people. Andrea vehemently opposed shock treatment. And Rusty was not a fan of it either. He wanted to see what they could do with medication. And on August 9th, Andrea was discharged from Memorial Spring Shadows Glen Hospital. She was transferred from their inpatient care into day treatment over at Memorial Herman Health Center. She left with orders to take 150 milligrams of Welbutrin twice a day, 75 milligrams of Effexor twice a day, 2 milligrams of Cogentin, this was to be taken at bedtime, and 5 milligrams of Haldol, which was also to be taken at bedtime. The Welbutrin and the Effexor are often prescribed together, even though they're both antidepressants. Apparently, Welbutrin, like, really counteracts uh, Effexor's side effect of decreasing one's libido. However, however, though Andrea was prescribed her meds and she could be seen, like, taking her meds, she had a habit of cheeking them, basically hiding them in her cheeks and then spitting them out when no one was looking. So the next day on August 10th, at her outpatient treatment, she reported that the return home was good, but it was stressful. She had, you know, four, four little boys in a new house. She said that she regretted her suicide attempt. She forgot that she was needed, you know, by her children and her family. She said that she wanted to get off all of her meds because taking Taking them made her feel like a weak person. The next day, Dr. Starbranch cut her Haldol dosage by half, and Andrea's mood seemed to change day by day for, for the next few days. And on August 13th, in a family therapy session with Dr. Sonia Burlingame, the doctor noted that Rusty was, quote, very eager for Andrea to be discharged and was, quote, putting some pressure on her to leave soon. Rusty told the doctor that Andrea was like 90 to 95% back to normal. Normal, but Andrea had reported that she felt only like 70 to 75% back to normal. Rusty told Dr. Burlingame that the family had a game plan, all right? Andrea's mother would help with the kids in the morning, and Rusty would work half the day from home. The doctor told him like, well, you know, the stress level's still going to be high, especially considering that the Yates had told her that they expected to homeschool all of their children. And they told her that they planned for even more children. So she was like, well, you know, the stress level's still going to be high, right? She said that they should consider Andrea's best interest when they're making their decisions. In group therapy on August 16th, Andrea reported that Rusty, you know, let her out to do some stuff for herself. Specifically, he allowed her a couple hours a week to, you know, kind of, kind of be with herself and do what she wanted. The group encouraged her to assert herself and demand more time, like a couple hours a week was not nearly enough. And Andrea said that she would like to learn how to enjoy herself again. But on that same day, in a session with Dr. Starbranch, Andrea said that she wanted to get off all of her meds. And this was because she and Rusty wanted to get pregnant again. Dr. Starbranch noted how Andrea's heart raced as she spoke about this. So I don't know if she had like Andrea hooked up to something or what. And she jotted down possible anxiety in her notes. She prescribed Andrea Ativan, which is a sedative for anxiety. And in group therapy, Andrea opened up a little bit more, saying that she had always been in like an eager to please person, very much a people pleaser. She reported that she was stressed as a kid when her dad lost his 
job for a year. She said that she wanted to communicate more, and she did admit that she mainly listened and deferred to Rusty. She said that when she would try to talk with him, he would usually just turn on the TV and like turn up the volume and kind of ignore her. Um, and this is whenever she tried to have like, you know, like a deep emotional conversation. Uh, that was not Rusty's favorite thing. The group encouraged her to, you know, tell him and, and assert yourself and tell him to turn off the TV so we can talk. And on August 18th, Dr. Starbranch's notes read, quote, apparently patient and husband plan to have as many babies as nature will allow. And she added an exclamation point. This will surely guarantee future psychotic depression. And on August 20th, Andrea was discharged from outpatient care. She told her her group and group therapy and that she was sad that she was leaving them. She felt support and, and connection there. And she, she was genuinely sad to be leaving them. She said that she did plan to continue therapy in Clear Lake, but she hadn't found anyone yet. She again announced how she wanted to get off any and all meds. And she admitted that she had never taken her Ativan despite feeling heavy anxiety. She had psychiatric appointments scheduled for August 26th and a hundred milligram shot of Haldol scheduled for the next day on the 27th. On Paul's second birthday, September 13th, Andrea was busy cooking and designing a very elaborately detailed homemade birthday cake. And it looked like a bright red three-dimensional truck, like Andrea just went all out. On October 14th, the Yates went to Dr. Starbranch. Apparently, Andrea wasn't getting her Haldol or Cogentin. I guess it was due to like a conflict with the stupid health insurance. And they wanted to know if Andrea could just like get off of it altogether. They said Andrea was doing better. Her appetite was back. She wasn't hallucinating, wasn't paranoid. She had no suicidal thoughts and wasn't depressed. Her short-term memory and her concentration had also improved. Andrea said that her energy level was good, though she wished she had more. She did have four small boys after all, on top of homeschooling. She said that she wasn't exercising though and she needed to run. Dr. Starbranch wrote in her notes that Andrea seemed to be quote, doing okay, but needs to be on her antipsychotic. She put Andrea on Zeprexia, Wilbutrin, and Effexor. And by mid-November, Andrea seemed to be doing better. She was running once a week, reported no, you know, suicidal thoughts or suicidal ideations or anything like that, wasn't depressed, anxious, wasn't paranoid, and she had started to see a therapist. Dr. Starbranch then halved her Zeprexia dosage while continuing the other two meds. And by mid-December, Andrea reported that she was, quote, doing great, aside for Christmas, was baking and decorating up a storm. She was running a couple times a week, still seeing her therapist, and had started homeschooling Noah. And at this point, Dr. Starbranch discontinued the Haldol, but she continued the other three medications. But when Andrea returned to Dr. Starbranch in January of the new year, 2000, she learned that Andrea had not been taking any of her medications since November. Andrea said that she was doing fine. Her only problem was that like, she felt a little restless during the day. She said Rusty didn't like her going off her meds but did agree with her that she seemed to be doing better. She said that she actually didn't want to take any meds unless she was symptomatic. And by March 2000, when Andrea became pregnant with her and Rusty's fifth child, she was completely off any and all medication. And it was at this time that those who did know the couple, like primarily Andrea's like family and stuff and some close friends and were aware of her mental health struggles, just I don't think they just knew the degree that she was suffering. All raised an eyebrow at this announcement of this fifth pregnancy. Many were wondering like why they would even have a child when Andrea was clearly struggling and they had like four young kids. And it really seems to be that when this fifth pregnancy is announced that family and friends start raising an eyebrow. Start wondering how great of an idea that really was to bring a fifth child into the mix. Now, like we mentioned, Andrea was homeschooling Noah. I believe she had started homeschooling John as well. And it said that when they were five years old, her boys could read on their own. They knew their alphabet, knew their numbers. The Yates were a, a member of the Sagemont Baptist Church like homeschool group. It was like some sort of support group. And I think they would meet and like go on field trips and stuff. Um, however, it said Andrea and the children only attended like a, like a couple field trips with the group. No one really talked to Andrea here beyond the like, oh, hi, how you doing? You know, have a great time type of thing. No one really knew her. Um, in fact, some members couldn't even really remember when Andrea and, and the kids showed up. It's like they just kind of like appeared one day. However, so it should be noted 
that though, you know, obviously Noah and John knew like their alphabet and numbers and stuff like that, it is said five-year-old John still wasn't even like properly potty trained and still wore diapers. And like, let's remember, like there's only two older children at this point. The oldest child is like, what, six or seven? So really not even that old. The rest are all infants and toddlers. And yeah, juggling like child rearing, caring for the house on top of homeschooling. I mean, something is going to slip through the cracks, right? Something is, is going to be neglected. Like after all, one person just can't possibly do all that, you know? Every morning while she was pregnant, Andrea would get up before sunrise and would take a dip in the community pool that was nearby uh, Diana Lake and she would swim laps. You know, remember she was totally into swimming in high school. So, you know, I think this was, was probably pretty healthy for her, both physically and mentally. On July 2nd, Andrea celebrated her 36th birthday. But funnily enough, even though she went to great lengths to bake cakes and stuff for her children and everyone else, she just celebrated her birthday with store-bought cake. I guess Luke like dove into the cake and like, you know, wiped frosting all over his, his face and stuff as kids do. He like, you know, wiped like the chocolate frosting all over his face. And Andrea was like recording this and like she was laughing and stuff. And then like hastily, like just suddenly, right? And hastily and sounding almost guilty, uh, she she stops laughing. Her voice turns like into more like, like panicked mode. And she began apologizing aloud, quote, that's chocolate cake. It's this thing. And she pans down to the cake. Quote, it's not dirt. Yeah. Like all of a sudden, like she's laughing, having a time. And then all of a sudden she's like, it's not dirt. I promise. It's just like cake. Like, yeah. Yeah. Andrea finally gave birth to the couple's fifth child, a daughter this time that they named Mary Deborah Yates. And she was born on November 30th, 2000. Now, despite her previous fragile mental state, Andrea seemed to be doing like okay after Mary's birth. Just 15 days after Mary had been born, Andrea threw a fifth birthday party for John. She and Noah baked a, a elaborate, like colorful hot air balloon cake. And as the Yates family all gathered for the event, Andrea sat with baby Mary in her lap and yeah there's like video recordings of like the birthday and stuff and yeah she seemed like relatively happy you know had little baby Mary bouncing on her lap. In December Andrea taught her children about medieval times and made a bunch of like costumes and stuff for them and she even wrote out a play that kind of like went over what they what they taught and they put it on for Rusty. But Andrea's normally enthusiastic voice on the video recording was more flat almost disinterested as she kind of fed the children her lines. On February 15th, Luke's second birthday, she baked a train cake with an individual boxcar cake for each child. Nine days later, it was Noah's birthday. And like always, a party was held. And of course, Andrea was videotaping away. And she, she still seemed outwardly happy at this point, you know. But unfortunately, on March 12th, 2001, Andrea's father passed away. And apparently, you know, they, they kind of knew it was coming. So he was able to have like his wife and children standing over his bedside, including Andrea. And it is said that she took this loss especially hard. She she spiraled. She became more depressed as the days went on. She slept maybe two hours a night, stopped eating, lost five pounds in three weeks, began mutilating herself again, including pulling out chunks of her own hair. And she started reading the Bible compulsively. Rusty said that she seemed overly concerned with caring for baby Mary. And she slid downhill so much that that on March 31st, Rusty took her to the Devereaux Treatment Center. He would later say that Dr. Starbranch was just too far away and that the Devereaux Center was, was much closer. Now, the center tells people that they have a 22-bed uh, acute care unit for adult patients who are suicidal or, quote, going psychotic and, quote, need to calm down. That's, that's how they advertise themselves. They say their usual treatment was two to three days and a week-long stay was, quote, historically unusual. Now, according to the Texas Department of Health, this facility, the Devereaux Treatment Center, had 29 pages of complaints lodged against them between the period of September 1st, 1996 and August 31st, 1999, which were the last day that these complaints were actually made available to the public. The complaints ranged from neglect to abuse, 
to death. Out of the 181 complaints, 106 were about a violation of patients' rights. Just over 28% of the 181 complaints were deemed valid. And in comparison, at Methodist, where Andrea like originally was, they had only six pages of complaints during that exact same time period, and less than 8% of those complaints were deemed valid. Not sure who the hell determines what like makes a complaint like valid or invalid. I, I would really love to know that. Now, now, Rusty said that he was still tired from Andrea's first depression when he took her to Devro. Yeah, he was still tired, guys, from her first depression. So when she was admitted to Devro, the only thing he asked, were the doctors there any good? And he was told, quote, they're all good. Andrea was admitted to the Devro Center under the diagnosis of major depression, reoccurring. And this was noted by Dr. Ellen Albritton. Dr. Albritton said that she was shocked at Andrea's state. And she was actually angry. At, at Rusty for, for letting her deteriorate so. Her hair was unkempt. Her clothes were baggy. They were very loose fitting. She sat like hunched over. She was very motionless. Dr. Albritton said, quote, I was very upset because the patient was so ill for some time. I wondered why she hadn't been presented to our facility sooner. And then over the course of many, many hours, many, many different assessments were, were taken and noted in Andrea's file. And most of these, you know, assessments came from from Rusty as once again, Andrea wasn't talking. So her assessments in her, in her, like her chart, they were written down, right? In one handwriting, but they were signed by another MD or licensed social worker, which, you know, indicated that these professionals didn't actually do the assessments themselves. In fact, a former employee, a psychiatric nurse who worked at Devro claimed proper protocols were not followed there. So she explained that the way psychiatric care is supposed to work is a team of doctors, nurses, nurses, therapists, even the insurance company, they all get together, right? And they come up with like a with like a team game plan for the patient along with uh, goals and, and time frames, all right? And this is all part of like this like care plan that they come up with together. She said it didn't work that way at Devro and none of the medical staff communicated with each other. And more often than not, proper protocols were not followed, even on patients who were on suicide watch. She said the center was constantly understaffed and the nurses were constantly burned out. And on April 1st, 2001, Andrea was put under the care of Dr. Mohammed Saeed. Now, it should be noted that Dr. Saeed, he's not a member of either the Texas Medical Association or the American Medical Association. Although memberships to these organizations uh, are, are not required of like licensed physicians. The psychiatric nurse who worked at Devro uh, with Dr. Saeed said that he could never be paged when he was needed. And when someone could finally get a hold of him, he, he seemed like irritated that he had been interrupted. She said he never showed up to meetings to discuss patient treatment, never spent more than five minutes with his patients, and in her view, never, quote, adequately listened to his patients as far as their signs and symptoms. And she said his notes on patients were sparse at best. She accused him of never even looking up from his notebook when he was talking to patients, like it was just looking down and writing, not even making eye contact with his patients. That's what this psychiatric nurse accuses him of. She said that she eventually requested never to work with him again, and she found him uncooperative and egotistical, thinking that, you know, just because he was a doctor, you know, he, he got to do whatever he want and, like, be the boss, and that's just not the way that it works. And the psychiatric nurse would say that a better doctor, even at Devro, could have given Andrea much better care than Dr. Saeed, but that's who she was stuck with. So Andrea answered very few of Dr. Saeed's questions, and he wrote that she was, quote, almost catatonic. The next day, he sat down with both of the Yates, and Rusty said that he had brought his wife in because he feared that she wouldn't last another day at home. He said that she had become distressed because she had, quote, dried off like she was no longer producing milk for baby Mary, and this really upset her. Dr. Saeed planned to try and engage Andrea in voluntary treatment, get her involved in, like, family therapy, put her back on her Effexor and Wellbutrin. But, so we talked with, with Rusty and Andrea, and that was sort of like the plan. But later that same day, Dr. Saeed and the Treatment Center's program director wrote Galveston County Probate Judge Gladys Burwell, and they wrote to her requesting Andrea be committed to Austin State Hospital, citing that she was catatonic, refusing to talk, refusing to eat, to drink, refusing to take her medications. Her urine output was so little 
that they feared she was at risk of kidney failure. And they also petitioned the court to allow Dr. Saeed to administer psychoactive medications. He wanted to put her on Respiradol, an antipsychotic, and Cogentin. And the next day, Andrea voluntarily signed herself in to Devro. So I don't know if she was like being like admitted under like Rusty's authority. I'm not sure. But the next day af after this, Andrea voluntarily uh, admits herself to Devro. And at this point, Dr. Seed wrote a new letter to the judge, uh, basically just saying, oh, you know what? That stuff we asked, never mind. Just, just forget it. So I'm not sure what that was about. And much like with her previous admissions, Andrea's time here at Devro would be marked with highs and lows, you know, had good days and bad days. She would refuse to answer questions, but then she would get to a point where she was dressing herself, even attending group therapy. But then she would then, you know, refuse to eat, only drink like Ensure protein shakes. And again, this was only at Rusty's insistence. Then she would recover her appetite and be fine. Though she was still not, not very open, still not communicating a whole lot. And she spoke, quote, only to have her needs met. On April 11th, after a roller coaster of progress, Andrea told Dr. Saeed that she felt 90% better and she asked to be discharged, as did Rusty. They both agreed to partial hospitalization. And the next day, she was released from the treatment center's inpatient care to partial hospitalization, PHP. And this is where the patient stays in the hospital during the day, but goes home at night. Andrea said that she was not suicidal at this time, and she was given prescriptions for Respiradol, Effexor, and Welbutrin. Her condition was marked, quote, improved in her chart. She was considered, quote, alert, and her discharge status was filed as, quote, routine. Her next appointment with Dr. Saeed was scheduled for May 4th, yet her medication supply was only for two weeks, so I don't know what was up with that. And the next day on April 13th, Andrea started her first and only day of PHP, partial hospitalization. She was described as being, quote, flat. And that evening, she told Rusty that she didn't even really see, like, what the point was and why she should continue with it. And Rusty agreed, since, you know, apparently all she had done that day was watch, like, a video on addiction. And he was like, well, her problem is an addiction. It's, like, with depression. So, you know, they, they didn't see the point in continuing that. But Dr. Saeed had written onto Andrea's chart that she had no complaints, was maintaining progress, and he saw no, quote, decompensation since her discharge of one day. Three days later, Dr. Saeed talked to Rusty, who said that Andrea was improving. She was more involved with the children. She was talking, but she was having trouble sleeping. They discussed upping her effexor, and Dr. Saeed then encouraged them to participate in PHP. But he said Rusty was very reluctant to do this. Dr. Saeed told him that, hey, I'll keep Andrea's chart open for another day, and if she doesn't want to return, she'll be fully discharged from Devro. And on April 18th, that is what she was. She was fully discharged. But according to Dr. Saeed's notes, her compliance was poor, she stopped attending PHP, and her condition upon discharge was listed as, quote, improved by report. So again, we already went over how apparently different people write a bunch of different notes in the charts. So I don't know if that's where that's supposed to come from, but like, I just thought that was super weird. Kind of like the conflicting stuff that's in her chart versus like what her actual behavior is, you know? So during the time she was hospitalized at Devro, Rusty ran into a coworker at the Krispy Kreme donut shop that had recently opened. You know, Rusty said hi and asked the coworker why he was there. He was there with his daughter. She had gotten like, I think A's on her report card and, and Krispy Kreme had something set up with like, the schools where, I don't know, like you get good grades and you get like a free donut or something. And Rusty laughed and commented that like, oh, well, you know, my kids are homeschooled, but you know, they, they don't get report cards like that. But yeah, maybe, maybe I should get Andrea to, you know, give them report cards and we could have something like that. Rusty was just very relaxed and carefree. And yeah, his coworker was floored when he found out that when he was talking to Rusty, Andrea was in the Devro treatment center, not doing well. It was just very bizarre to him. And in late March, 2001, Right before she was admitted to Devro, Rusty walked into the HEP bookstore, which was co-owned by Terry Arnold. So this was a bookstore that specialized in like homeschool materials and books and stuff. And Terry said that she she remembers Rusty because it was it was pretty rare for a man to walk into her store. Most of her clients were were females. He told her that his wife had told him about this place and he wanted to check it out. So yeah, Terry Terry showed him around. She had like in the back there like she had like a bunch of books and stuff, you know, and in the back there was like a children's table and chairs and like books and toys and stuff. Rusty said that he quote, liked it and said, quote, I'll tell my wife about it. Which again is weird because he said Andrea told him about it and that's why he was there. But 
Okay. And a few weeks later in April, Andrea showed up with the kids and they would visit the store about four to six times that month. I'm guessing probably starting around the 13th or so when she stopped doing PHP. Terry said that each time they arrived, Noah, who was the oldest, would sort of like herd his three younger brothers in like a in like an orderly line. They would all hold hands as Andrea, who, you know, had baby Mary, would walk up to the store and then Noah would open the door for his mother and, and siblings. Terry said it was obvious that Noah was the leader and was just like a little gentleman. She said when he smiled, it took over his whole face, quote, you couldn't help but fall in love with that. Terry said each time Andrea would go to the back of the store, you know, set the kids down at the little table and then carefully and methodically thumb through the books and pick out everything that she needed. And Terry always marveled at how well behaved these children were. Terry would soon begin to sit down with the Yates children when they would come in, you know, she would see them and get all excited. And so she would, you know, tell, tell the employees like, hey, um, I'm not available during this time because I'm going to sit down with the Yates children and, and hang out with them. She said she loved bouncing little two-year-old Luke on her lap. She said Noah would always wear a purple shirt, which was his favorite color and her favorite color too. They would always talk about that. She said Andrea never talked much, but she did speak to her and she was like friendly. One time Terry asked her if like, hey, are you guys going to have any more children? And Andrea said that the, she they would very much like to, but it probably wouldn't happen. And Terry said that Andrea seemed very upset at this. Now, Terry, who had five children of her own, like sympathized with Andrea. She's like, yeah, we wanted more kids too, but we couldn't. And she said when Andrea came to visit her in her store, she was, she was always well-dressed. Like nothing like, you no know, fancy clothes or anything, but like, you know, her hair was obviously kempt. It was like in a loose braid and she would come with her shirt tucked into her jeans. And like she, you know, she had like cute little funky earrings that she would wear. Like to Terry, Andrea was, you know, well put together. And she said the children were also well-dressed and obviously like bathed and well taken care of. She said Andrea usually bought a few items at HEP at a time, always paid in cash. Terry thought Andrea was quite personable. You know, she was quiet, but she was confident and, and friendly. And yeah, didn't come across to Terry as browbeaten. Apparently Terry worked with runaway children, you know, so she was always sort of like on the alert for any potential signs of abuse or neglect or something. And she said that she never picked up on any of that with Andrea and the children. Now, the last time Andrea and her children would visit Terry at the HEP bookstore would be the first week of June 2001. And after the events of today's case, Terry would reminisce on the times that she saw Andrea and the children in the store. And it suddenly struck her as odd that Rusty had come in to sort of like inspect the store. That's kind of like how it was coming off to her in hindsight. And she thought that was odd. She was like, my husband would never do that. But, you know, she also was like, well, maybe he was just in the neighborhood, you know, and like wanted to check out the store. But yeah, certainly after the events of today's case, all of Rusty's like little eccentric, like weird behavior would certainly be put into a, a new light. The hair salon that Andrea had gone to at least a couple of times called Hair Innovations. Um, it was owned by Don Hellman. And this hair salon had had customers who knew the Yates. Um, however, some, some of these people had a little bit of a different characterization of the Yates than what Terry had. So some of these people thought it was weird how all of the Yates kids had like biblical names. They thought that was weird. Another customer who was an attorney uh, stated outright that Rusty Yates was quote weird, um, that he had a disturbing obsession with reproduction and that the dude was just a weirdo, he, like was not a big fan of him. This customer also said that the children were never allowed outside of the house, were never allowed to go to anyone else's house, like like friends or anything. And it was said that Andrea could be seen in the yard, you know, tending to the, the flower beds as the children played and she would walk them to the mailbox, but she didn't really venture further than that. And it was said that her and the children would even like wait outside in the yard for Rusty to get home every night. And yeah, after the events of, of today's case, all of these characterizations of the Yates family were, were definitely put into a new light. And after Andrea's full discharge from Devro, Rusty's mother, Dora, came from Tennessee to stay with the family for a little bit. Although I, I believe she stayed in a hotel, not in the home, which kind of makes sense, right? You don't want like added stress to Andrea. Like even though you're trying to help her out, you don't want to like add more stress. You know what I mean? And on May 3rd, Noah and John came running up to their grandmother and they were asking like, hey, why, why is mom filling a bathtub? You know, it's the middle of the day. And so she's like, what? So she, she goes, she goes in the back room and yeah, Andrea has the bathtub going and she's filling it up with water. And since this is the middle of the day, Dora asked her like, hey, what are you doing? And Andrea replied that she was doing it, quote, in case I need it. Now, Dora thought maybe Andrea had maybe just like filled the tub and like forgotten about it or something. And she didn't really think much of it. 
Andrea would later confess that she had actually planned to drown her children that day, but she had decided against doing it right then. Now, Dora informed her son of this incident when he got home, and fearing that Andrea's mental health was slipping, Rusty drove Andrea back to Dr. Saeed's office, reporting that she wasn't eating or drinking enough. He mentioned the bathtub incident and described his wife as, quote, nearly catatonic, but again, not suicidal. Rusty talked with the doctor about the medication cocktail that he thought had helped Andrea in the past. It was the Haldol, Cogentin, Effexor, and Wellbutrin, and that was what he wanted Dr. Saeed to prescribe to Andrea, while apparently Dr. Saeed wanted to do shock therapy. Rusty was vehemently against this, and that's when Dr. Saeed then agreed to put Andrea on the Haldol, and Rusty agreed to readmit Andrea to Devro that night. And when she was brought to Devro for a second time, Andrea was described as, quote, sad, depressed, tearful, not talking. She was admitted for a 10-day stay. And Dr. Saeed's notes on his patient are not very detailed. They gloss over much of Dr. Starbranch's notes, which he had actually, he had gotten like consent to get Dr. Starbranch's notes on Andrea. And yeah, compared to Dr. Starbranch's notes, Dr. Saeed's were like, yeah, very sparse, not very detailed, and glossed over a lot of Dr. Starbranch's. He listed once again that he suggested shock therapy and that Rusty had refused. And the only times Andrea would eat or drink uh, were at, you know, Rusty's insistence. He had to like coax her into eating or drinking anything. Though Dr. Saeed would report that Andrea was quote, up and about. And at this time, Rusty thought that Andrea was way over medicated. On May 10th, Rusty and Andrea attended a family therapy session where once again, Andrea didn't speak and Rusty did most of the talking. He said Andrea was nonverbal with him and he had to guess what she was feeling, thinking, what she wanted. He described her as a quote, pack rat said she was the, quote, baby of the family, and that Karen, Andrea's mother, was, quote, hard on her. He also stressed that he had taken time off work, you know, to stay home and help with the children, but he was considering on getting a housekeeper. On the 12th, in another family therapy session, Andrea said that she had no issues to discuss, and Rusty stated that they had no issues to discuss as a couple. Later that evening, Rusty was visiting with Andrea, along with the children, and he told Andrea that the doctor said that she was well enough to go home, and apparently she didn't react at all to this. A patient who watched the couple at this time described as Andrea following Rusty, quote, like a puppy would follow its owner. On the 14th, Andrea told Dr. Saeed that she was not suicidal, though she did have thoughts of suicide on and off, but currently she was not suicidal. And she didn't dwell on these suicidal thoughts, and she had no intention of following through. Now, it was noted that Andrea was never asked if she had homicidal thoughts, only suicidal thoughts. She also told Dr. Saeed that she was ready to go home, and she was ready to participate participate in PHP. And it was here that Dr. Saeed decided to discharge Andrea unless Rusty objected. He wrote in his notes, quote, husband can call and talk to me. And we are only like one or two days before the events of today's case. And Andrea takes the life of her children. And we will get into that next week with part two. Yeah, sorry for doing such a well-known case, but I personally have never gotten to take a deep dive into this case. And this case has always, you know, kind of just really made me really sad. And especially when I researched the Dina Schlosser case, it just made me, made me want to do a deep dive on, on Andrea's case. And yeah, it's just, it's just so sad. And, and next week we will finish up the, the case. We'll get into how she drowned her children. We'll get into the immediate aftermath, her trials and stuff. And yeah, it's just, it's just so sad. So sad. I don't know. I think I just, this, this stuff always like, like scares me, frankly, like that, that's what creeps me out is like your your mind turning on you like that. Cases like this just really, really get to me. And yeah, we'll, we'll be back next week for Crime Dive, where we will do part two of the Andrea Yates case. And then to finish out November, I will have requested cases. Yes, I have been working on the requested cases that you guys give to me. Like you guys, you guys have really thrown some like good ones my way. So I have been dutifully working on that. But yeah, until until next week when we will finish up with Andrea Yates, I hope you have a wonderful week. Take care of yourself. Be safe, happy, and healthy. And remember, don't be a dick, man. Just, just don't be a douche. I mean, kind of like what we're talking about with this case. You never know what someone is going through. So just just play it safe and, and don't be an a-hole, you know? Just just be a, a decent person. Alrighty, y'all. I will see you next week. Bye-bye.